Yeah, no, no plays out. Okay. Anyone else? Mm-hmm. It's hard to notice people with masks, huh? Yeah. Mommy, oh yeah, there's mommy. Anyone else? Paul, want to test it? Okay. Let's test it. Test, 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 test. Okay, I'll, should I start again? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the notes are in my head, so hopefully I won't mess them up. Uh, the other day I was watching a clip from uh, The Chosen, that made-for-TV miniseries about Jesus, and there was a scene between Nicodemus and Jesus talking to each other. And uh, uh, Nicodemus kind of wondering if Jesus is the Messiah, and Jesus says, what does your heart tell you? And he kind of overwhelmingly kind of takes a breath and says, my heart is full of fear and wonder. And I often feel that way. That's what Jesus sometimes gives my soul. And I realize the fear for me is mainly not maybe wanting to hear everything that I have to obey because my selfish heart wants to do its own thing. Um, and I think that kind of leads into the sermon that Jacob is going to be doing today. Yeah, just a second. You can pray after. Uh, so whether you are here because you are curious about who this Jesus is, uh, whether you know him a little bit but want to learn more, or whether you are deeply in love with him, you are in the right place. So welcome here, everybody. I'm going to open our time with Psalm 51, and then we'll see if this sweet little girl here is going to pray. Psalm 51, verse 7. Purify me from all my my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and make me willing to obey you. Let's pray. I get out of the bed. No, say it again slowly. You want to say it slowly? Okay. I'll, I'll say it for you, okay? Can I say it for you? Okay. Thank you, God, for all my friends. Amen. Let's continue to praise together. <clears throat> We're going to sing, uh, You Are Worthy of My Praise, and I invite you to stand. strength 
We get the joy and privilege to pray together. Uh, it'll be a bit of a two-part prayer today. Um, if you're not aware, uh, we have bulletins that are at the back, uh, little round tables by near the doors. And on the back part is a bit of a prayer guide. Feel free to take that home and remember how you can pray for the church, its people, and God's mission. Today I'm going to be praying through that for our first part. And for the second part, I'm going to lead us in a uh, bit of a personal prayer where we can confess some things to our God. So let's bow together. Father, we thank you so much for having this opportunity to meet in person again. Uh, we thank you for um, yeah, leading us through this wild year and a half or so. Um, we, we still have thankfulness towards you and we have joy in our hearts for getting us to this point. And we, we ask for your continued leading uh, um, with your spirit in our own lives for our government, for wise decision making. Uh, we trust you and we are thankful that we have you to trust and not just people and other humans. Uh, we would like to pray right now for some of our people and the things that are happening. We pray for Anita and Al Kaler, whose father John passed away, 
at the age of 101. Um, be with that family as they mourn and celebrate that wonderful man. We pray for our friend William Beecraft, who's mourning the loss of his wife, Audrey. Um, help us to rally around him um, and get to know him better as we uh, plan a service for, for his wife in September. We pray for Miles, uh, whose grandma, Delia Wood, passed away recently. Comfort him. We pray for Carl and Pat Whitehead as they return to Papua New Guinea with w Wycliffe Bible translators on August 2nd. Uh, and I understand there's some more confusion with their flights and connecting flights. Um, with COVID, we know that everything is just more confusing and interrupted. So we pray for provision for that and ease of transport as they go on your mission. We also ask for continued protection for Gordon Becky Clausen and their camp ministry at Gem Lake as for weeks, if not months already, they've been experiencing wildfire danger very close to their camp. Thank you for all the firefighters that are helping um, trying to control all these wildfires in, in our province and across our nation. And with that, we also pray for rain. Um, for our Manitoba farmers and those living in areas that are threatened by all these fires across Canada. Um, without rain, we don't have crops, and crops, we struggle to have enough food. So we ask for your hand in providing more rain falling from the skies, and we thank you for seeing some this week. We celebrate with Jared and Nadine as they had the safe arrival of their son, Xander, uh, on July 14th, and we pray for Sean and the VBS crew as they prepare to lead uh, August 3rd to 6th, and we pray that volunteers will come to him. Father, we now want to take this time to um, commit ourselves to you, to submit our minds and our hearts to you. Whether it's a brokenness we already have or a brokenness we need, our prayer is to be drawn deeper towards Jesus. Pray this with me. I'm prone to wander, but where could I go that you aren't there? So here's my heart, Lord, with all of its doubts and fears and prayers. Lord, we confess our doubts to you now. Lord, we confess and entrust our fears to you now. And Lord, hear these prayers of our heart. Honestly, I need to be broken. Honestly, I need to fall down. Go ahead and shake my foundation. Because honestly, I'm figuring out that all that I have and all that I need is you. In the powerful, victorious name of Jesus, amen.
Well, I don't think we have a lot of little kids that may want to come and sit with me. You can sit on the floor in front here if you would like to. Oh, we have one of our newest little members here. For all of you that don't recognize him, this is Ezekiel. Can you say hi? No. And Ezekiel's mom, Vicky. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and here come Nova and Celia. So, this first sentence that I'm going to that I'm going to read as part of my story, I'll read it and then I'm going to ask you how many of you can relate to this. I'm so bored. Jeremy said, sighing. I don't think I can stand another day like this. It's so hot. How many of you can relate to that? <laughs> yeah. Is, are there some days that it's so hot? And then what do you do? What do you do when it's so hot? Uh, have popsicles. Have popsicles. That's a great idea. Popsicles are one of my favorites. Well, Jeremy and Stella, in my story, didn't have popsicles. They said, hey, let's go swimming down at Taylor's Pond. I don't know. We better not. Your grandma said to stay away from that pond, and there's a big no trespassing fishing or swimming sign right there by the water. And besides, that would be disobeying your grandma. Oh, do you think they should go? They, exactly, Nova, you're smart. Come on, let's be adventurous. We aren't going fishing, and, and whoever comes, they don't care about some old sign. We can pretend we didn't see it, or that we can't read. Oh, wait a minute. Besides, Grandma won't know. She's upstairs taking a nap. But how many of you have grandmas that know these things? Even though they may be taking a nap, they have a, they have a sense that Grandkids are maybe not doing what they're supposed to. We'll be there and back before she wakes up. We'll be really quiet and no one will ever know, said Stella. I don't think we should, said Jeremy. That sign was put there for a reason. Look, that sign isn't for us. It's for people who don't live around here. That's all. I'm going whether you go or not, Stella said, huffing as she ran out the door. Taylor's pond was just down the road from Stella's house. She had been wanting to go swimming all summer, ever since she arrived at Grandma's house for her summer vacation. The pond was lined with beautiful pink flowering bushes, purple wildflowers, and gigantic evergreen trees, and there were woods right next to it. Sometimes you could see deer wander out of the woods for a cool drink of water. If you didn't live nearby, you would never know it was there. Wow, it's a really big pond, big pond, said Jeremy hesitantly as they climbed through the bushes. Isn't it wonderful, cried Stella. Come on, let's jump in. You go ahead, I'll just sit here by the tree and watch you, said Jeremy. Boy, you're such an old fuddy-duddy, said Stella as she jumped into the pond and started splashing around. After a few minutes, she cried, Hey, Jeremy, the water's great. Come on in. But Jeremy was nowhere to be found. Stella climbed out of the water and began looking around. Come on, Jeremy, where are you? This isn't funny. After searching for a few minutes and still not finding him, Stella was getting really worried. She decided she needed to go get some help. Grandma, Grandma, cried Stella as she ran into the house. Jeremy's missing. I can't find him. What? said Grandma. Where did you see him last? Taylor's Pond. When I jumped in the water, Jeremy was sitting under a tree. Uh, I was just swimming around, and when I looked back on the bag, he was gone. Oh my, let's call for help, and then go see if we can find him. I hope he hasn't drowned. What? Don't you know? Jeremy can't swim, said Grandma. He never told me that. Hurry, we have to find him. <coughs> Stella and her grandma ran back to the pond just as the police and fire department arrived. 
Everyone was calling his name and looking for him. I found him, cried a police officer as he and Jeremy walked out of the woods. Oh, Jeremy, where were you, said Stella as she raced towards her best friend. I thought something horrible happened to you when I couldn't find you. Nah, I am okay. I just went into the woods to explore, he said. Well, why didn't you tell me you were going into the woods, said Stella. Well, I was embarrassed because I can't swim. That's why I didn't want to go swimming with you, said Jeremy. Well, I know that now. Grandma told me. Her voice trailed off as she looked at her grandma. Stella, I think we need to have a talk, said grandma. There's a reason I told you to stay away from Taylor's Pond. Even if Jeremy could swim, something terrible could have happened to either one of you. I know, but it was so hot and we were so bored. I understand that, but you deliberately disobeyed me, Stella. There are rules for children and grandchildren. They are there for your safety and the safety of others. How would you have felt if something had happened to Jeremy? It would just be terrible, a terrible feeling to have to live with something happening to you or your best friend just because you disobeyed. There are rules in life that we all must follow. We may not understand them or even think they're for us or even like them, but we have to follow them. Luckily, nothing happened to you or Jeremy this time, but you might not be so lucky the next time. I think we need to go home so that you can think about what you've done. You know, I have some extra chores that might help you think about being disobedient in the future. It may take you a week or so to get them done, but I know you can do it, admonished, admonished Grandma. I know. I'm so sorry, Stella sighed. I won't ever disobey again, disobey again Grandma. There's a verse in Ephesians 6, verses 1 to 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, for this is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. So when I found this story, and I read through it a couple of times, I thought about it long and hard. It's not just children that must obey. There are laws and rules that adults have to obey as well. Things like speed limits when we're driving. Whether you are young or older, Stealing is wrong, and it may not be stealing money from someone, but it's also not doing the job that we were asked to do or slap, slacking off at work because we think no one will notice. We are not doing what we agreed to when we do the job. So adults, we need to set an example for the young ones, and we need to follow the, the rules and the laws and not disobey. Okay, we're done. I'm going to start crying if I go any further here. So, do you obey your mom and dad? Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Nova. Such big girls. So you can go back and you can sit down now. And Pastor Jacob is going to come up in a few minutes and he's going to have the sermon. So I will be reading from 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 to 21. As Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons to be judges over Israel. Joel and Abijah, his oldest sons, held, co held court in Belsheba. But they were not like their father, for they were greedy for money. They accepted bribes and perverted justice. Finally, all the elders of Israel met at Ramah to discuss the matter with Samuel. Look, they told him, you are now old and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. Samuel was displeased with their request and went to the Lord for guidance. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for they are rejecting me, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. Ever since I brought them from Egypt, they have continually abandoned me and followed other gods. And now they are giving you the same treatment. Do as they ask, but solemnly warn them about the way a king will reign over them. So Samuel passed on the Lord's warning to the people who were asking him for a king. This is how a king will reign over you, Samuel said. The king will draft your sons and assign them to his chariots and his charioteers, 
making them run before his chariots. Some will be generals and captains in his army. Some will be forced to plow in his fields and harvest his crops, and some will make his weapons and chariot equipment. The king will take your daughters from you and force them to cook and bake and make perfumes for him. He will take away the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his own officials. He will take a tenth of your grain and your grape harvest and distribute it among his officers and attendants. He will take your male and female slaves and demand the finest of your cattle and donkeys for his own use. He will demand a tenth of your flocks and you will be his slaves. When that day comes, you will beg for relief from this king you are demanding, but then the Lord will not help you. But the people refused to listen to Samuel's warning. Even so, we still want a king, they said. We want to be like the nations around us. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle. So Samuel repeated to the Lord what the people had said. Good morning, church. It's good to see all of you and uh, some of you we haven't seen for a while. And we're delighted for how God is answering prayer and we're able to resume and more of us being back in the building. I'm at that stage of life now where occasionally when I talk to family members or some friends, they are surprised at a challenge that they are facing that they hadn't anticipated would be as difficult as it is proving to be. When we're younger, we think that the biggest challenge we face is to become successful, to build up the business or to make the farm thrive. But it's later on in life, when you have accumulated and when you've built up this large business, whether it's a factory or a farm, or a business of sales, at some point you come to the realization that you might want to retire. And what do you now do with what is in your hands? Your children might not want to be farmers or to take over the farm. Or your children might not be deemed capable of running the business, the complexities of what it takes. And now what do you do? I've watched that, I've observed that, and I've had conversations around those themes. And often, and maybe another thing that I think about, maybe you have worked for a company, a business, and uh, the owner has been very kind and gracious and a good boss. But the owner is now thinking about retirement, and you've watched the sons, and the way that they deal with people or the way that they deal with money and your job isn't quite as secure or as enjoyable anymore. And that's a little bit what we face here in our text. It's really quite a fascinating text. And I'll give a bit of a background. If you're fresh with us or new here, whether in person or online, we are in the Older Testament book of 1 Samuel. And our text this morning is a very key text in the development of the people of Israel as a nation. In our text, they are now moving from a more tribal group of people to a group of tribal people with localized leadership to a monarchy, a king, a different form of government. Um, God had when they were settling into the promised land, he had given them some instructions about how they should govern. And we find that in Deuteronomy chapter 16. I'll read a few verses. Chapter 16, verse 18. Appoint judges and officials for yourselves from each of your tribes in all the towns the Lord has given you. They must judge the people fairly. You must, uh, you must never twist justice or show partiality. Never accept a bribe, for bribes build blind the eyes of the wise and corrupt the decisions of the godly. Let true justice prevail so that you may live and occupy the land that the Lord has, is giving you. 
uh, and then a little bit more instructions about idols. But it seems that God, in the first place, said, appoint judges from each of your tribes in all the towns that the Lord has given you. So it was a decentralized form of governance. Judges for the various tribes. And it seems that in Samuel's lifetime, a slow transition began to take place. Samuel was deeply, and we've read about this in the last uh, Sundays, Samuel, as a judge, was deeply respected and sought after, not just by his local tribe, but by the various regions around them. If we go back to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3, right at the beginning of his life and his ministry, verse 19, as Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him, and everything Samuel said proved to be reliable. And all Israel, from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and gave messages to Samuel there at the tabernacle. And Samuel's words went out to all the people of Israel. Now, when we first read that, that might not have seemed very significant. But a number of times in this book, there's this reference, an underlining that Samuel was respected, that he was giving governance, direction, judging, not just locally, but uh, he would travel. In fact, we have that in chapter 7. Uh, just before the text, our text today, verse 13 to 17, uh, Oh, I'll just start in verse 15. Samuel continued as Israel's judge for the rest of his life. Each year he traveled around, setting up his court, first at Bethel, then at Gilgal, and then at Mespah. He judged the people of Israel at each of these places. Then he would return to his home in Ramah, and he would hear cases there. And Samuel built an altar to the Lord at Ramah. So we have this sense that instead of just these regional judges, Samuel has become this overall respected judge that traveled around the whole area of Israel, the whole nation. And now this godly and deeply respected leader is getting old and the people were very concerned. And although and if you read chapter 7, there had been a reprieve from the Philistines' invasion. Uh, this aggressive neighbor had remained a constant threat and fear. A little bit like the Cold War that some of us remember of old. There was no war going on, but we always were suspicious of what the Russians were up to. In chapter 7, we have a glimpse of how Samuel helped them through prayer. They slowly learned to trust God and his unconventional strategies of beating the Philistines. But Samuel is now older, and his sons, we're told in our text, were not like Samuel. And by observing their, these sons' ungodly behavior, the elders were quite sure that these sons did not have the kind of connection to the Almighty that their old man had had. And they must have observed their neighbors and noticed the efficiency and the benefits of a centralized government. And to some extent, they had began experiencing it. If they were to have a fighting chance of resisting the invasions and the attacks of the Philistines when the old man passed away, they would surely need a centralized government, a king that could build up an army and maintain their safety and security. But now was the task. And some of you have been in this journey. How do you approach your aging father to give up his driving license?
How do you tell mother that maybe she's too old to be in her home to look after herself, that she needs to take that other step? Oh, those are sacred, pretty scary conversations, aren't they? It's hard to get old. It's hard to watch people that you admire, that you respect, get older and frail and not able to do for themselves or for you what they used to be able to do. I think it was very real. Our text says in verse 4, finally, because none of those meetings ever happen very quickly, finally, all the elders of Israel met at Ramah to discuss the matter with Samuel. Sounds a little familiar to some family gatherings that we might have been a part of. Look, they told him, you are now old, and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. <sighs> One thing to say it, it's another thing to hear it. Some of you might have been in a place or are in a place where you hear it or where you wonder when that meeting will come. The old man didn't take it very well. Samuel was displeased. <laughs> uh, that's probably a gentle word for what he really felt. I can imagine. Samuel was displeased with their request and went to the Lord for guidance. Now there's a take home. Samuel was displeased, but held his mouth and went to the Lord for guidance. If I, nothing else that I say makes any sense or is of any value, that little phrase is worth something. Samuel was displeased with what he heard but he went to the Lord for guidance. God's response surprised me. Samuel's didn't so much. As I began digging, I noted that the request for a king did not come as a surprise to God. God had foreseen this day and had already given instructions and set boundaries for the monarchy when and if it should happen. This totally changed my sermon. So here it is. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, we had just read a little bit from 16, but now in 17, there's a whole section. Now listen to this. Verse 14. You are about to enter the land of that the Lord your God is giving you. When you take it over and set, settle there, when you take it over and settle there, you may think, we should select a king to rule us like all the other nations around us. If this happens, be sure to select a king, the man the Lord your God chooses. You must appoint a fellow Israelite, and it must not be a foreigner. Now listen, and now here comes the instructions. But isn't it fascinating? God, way back, or as they were settling into the land, years before said the time might come when you all of a sudden get this idea that you want a king. And now in 1 Samuel, the people are at that stage. They didn't surprise God. We hardly ever surprise God. And, and here, now listen to this. He tells them how to choose a king and how the king is to behave. The king must not build up a large stable of horses for himself or send his people to Egypt to buy horses. For the Lord has told you, you must never go back to Egypt. Verse 17, the king must not take many wives for himself because they will turn his heart away from the Lord. 
and he must not accumulate large amounts of wealth in silver and gold for himself. The king is not to get very rich. When he sits on the throne as king, he, now listen to this. This is totally unbelievable and fascinating. Verse 18. When he sits on the throne as king, he must copy for himself this body of instructions on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. As king, he is to copy the instructions from the Lord. Not a servant, but he himself is to copy it while the Levites look on. And then it says why. So that he will learn to live by this. And then it says later on that this regular reading will prevent him from becoming proud and acting as if he is above his fellow citizens. It will also prevent him from turning away from these commands in the smallest way. And it will secure that his, he and his descendants will reign for many generations in Israel. That is fascinating. This is how you are to select a king, this is how the king is to behave. And here are the boundaries that I set for a king that you would choose. Not to become rich. Not to become high and haughty and proud. To always remember that he is one of the people. But most importantly, that every day he would read the scripture. So that he would know how to behave. That's incredible. And that helps me understand 1 Samuel a little bit better. Verse 7. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied. For it is me that they are rejecting, not you. Do as they ask, but solemnly warn them about the way a king will reign over them. And then there is the warning. But I first want to ask, what was it that was wrong here? What do we make of this? Was asking for a king wrong? Was it about the timing or the motivation? A king like other nations around us? When I look at the warning, I notice the king will draft your sons and assign them to chariots. The king will take your daughters from you. He will take away the best of the field. He will take tenth of your grain. He will take your male and your female. He will demand a tenth of your flock. And you will be his slaves. When that day comes, hmm, this was the instructions for the king. And this is the warning. There's a huge gap, isn't there? And that was the problem, I think. God knew that they were not yet ready for a king. And that a king was not yet ready for them. That if they selected a king now, they would not have a godly king. That's my proposal. You might think differently, and I think there are some other options. I also noted, here it was, he will take your sons into the army, into his chariot races. He will take your daughters to make him food and uh, to make his soaps. He will take, he will take, he will take. I noticed originally that they were unhappy with Samuel's sons because why? They were greedy. And so the warning seems to be, you think that's bad? <laughs> These two sons and their little misdemeanors? The little greeting and the taking that they're doing on the sly? Well, the king will do it, but with your permission. Or his. Doesn't sound much better. But this is it. 
But the people refused to listen to Samuel's warning. Even so, we still want a king, they said. We want to be like the nations around us. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle. And I think that's the clue for us. And I'll try to wrap up pretty quickly now. What do we learn about God from this chapter? God knew that these tribes were not yet ready for a king and that the king was not ready for the task. But he gave them the warning and then he allowed them to choose. God knew. He warned them, but then he gave them the ability to choose. In Genesis chapter 3, he placed Adam and Eve in the garden, but he gave them the ability to choose. Today, God has placed us, and there are many choices before us. And God continues to give us instructions and also warnings. But he gives us the ability to choose. God does not rule the wor world the way that I would, or you, or a king. God is not a tyrant. He does not take. He does not force. Remember that story with Jesus, the fellow that came to him with the question? Jesus looked at him and loved him. Yet he allowed him to walk away. That is the kind of God we have. The kind of God we see here in Samuel. What does that mean for us as friends, as parents, as pastors and leaders? We warn. We instruct. But ultimately, we must let people choose. It must be harder for God than it is for us. And what do we learn about ourselves, about mankind in this chapter? I think the whole chapter is such a strong reflection of us. It had not been easy, but they had, to some extent, and for a short period, relied on God for protection. And it seemed to have worked. But with the old man dying, they needed a new form of security. And they looked at their what their neighbors were doing and said, let's do that. You and I live in chapter 8 every day. There is this sense of living with God, walking with God in his truth and in obedience to God. But sometimes God's ways seem so counterintuitive, so upside down, so weak that we find it hard to trust. We fear that we are missing out. We fear financial failure, health. And we hear God saying, trust me on this one. Obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And on so many levels, whether in the area of our own sexuality and our desires, the various desires that we have to, for sexual fulfillment or for financial gain or for security, in all of those situations, God says, trust me on this. But we so easily look at our neighbors, what they are doing and what they are offering. And we say, God, we hear you, but we still want the instant gratification. 
the shortcut, the thing that seems more secure in the moment. I know, I know, but this feels so right, at least right now. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for it is me they are rejecting, not you. They don't want to be, they don't want me to be their king any longer. Ever since I brought them from Egypt, they have continually abandoned me and followed other gods. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, Lord. Take and seal it for your courts above. to invite you to sing with us salvation belongs to our god stand up if you would prefer Some life-giving announcements. One of them uh, to announce Jacob and Arlene are headed to Ontario to visit some family in the next two weeks. So a little change in the announcement in the bulletin. Um, so we wish them a rich time of connecting with family after for so long not being able to see them. 
Okay, I'll, okay. Are you obeying daddy? Hi, I'm Jay. I'm Jay. Yeah, okay, very good. Um, Jesus and then, love. Jesus love, yeah, very sweet, no, Zay Zay. <laughs> Can the daddy talk now? Yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, and at the back of the bulletin, uh, the announcement for the VBS happening for grades two to nine, volunteers are needed. So you can talk to Sean, he's at the back here today, um, or you can phone him as well. And I think the only other thing I wanted to finish off with was uh, for our, our blessing and our, our statement as we leave today. And I'm, I don't dare sing it. Maybe I should practice my singing so I can do that next time. Yeah, almost. Uh, is probably a song that we've all heard um, in Sunday school, but I'm just going to say it out loud as a statement to close this service. It seems fitting. Uh, On Christ the solid rock we stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Amen. Say bye. <laughs>